<laughs> well, thank you for joining us. This is our first time to try a webinar for Hand to Hold. And so uh, I appreciate y'all's patience with us as we learn the technology ourselves and the best way to do this. But I am Kelly Kelly. I'm the founder and CEO of Hand to Hold. And we are delighted that you have joined us today to, to hear from one of uh, the world's most trusted and beloved pediatricians, Dr. Harvey Karp. I'm a huge fan, and we are just so glad that he is joining us today. He's the founder and CEO of The Happiest Baby, a smart tech and parenting solutions company. And he's been practicing pediatrics in Los Angeles for more than 25 years and has devoted his life to helping families raise healthy and happy children. He is one, again, one of the most renowned baby and sleep experts. He's the author of several books that you may be familiar with, The Happiest Baby, The Happiest Baby on the Block, The Happiest Toddler, and uh, The Happiest Baby Guide to Great Sleep, which we're gonna be talking more about. So welcome, Dr. Carp. Thank you so much. You and I had the pleasure of meeting almost a decade ago, and you know I'm a huge fan, so I'm just delighted to share you with our Hand to Hold audience today. Thank you, Kelly, and thanks so much for organizing this. It's a great opportunity to have a chance to talk to everybody. Um, as you said, I'm a pediatrician, and uh, for almost 30 years, I practiced um, here in California. I live in Los Angeles, um, and so I was kind of the neighborhood doctor, you know, that you bring your kids to. I had a little house that was uh, our office. You know, usually you go into a medical building these days, but uh, for, for almost... Um, I guess 15 years or so I practiced out of a house where the living room was converted into the waiting room and the bedrooms upstairs were converted into exam rooms and the kids could play out in the yard. And it was really such a nice old fashioned, you don't think of that in Los Angeles maybe, but it was a nice old fashioned way for kids to, to get their care and to get to be a pediatrician. So. Well, so, I'm excited. I, we actually just recently, um, there's a new pediatrician's office that uh, sprung up near us, and it's um, a setting uh, very similar to that. So maybe we'll see kind of a, a, us going back to that kind of practice where we really get to know our doctor and have that um, more comfortable setting. So today we're going to talk about um, several things. You're expert in sleep, so we definitely have some a lot of questions around that. We want to talk about developmental milestones. Uh, throughout the month of September, Hand to Hold is talking about milestones. We celebrate milestones in the NICU, and we know how important milestones are for our NICU graduates. So we're glad we're going to be able to talk about that. And then transitioning home. That's a big, scary time for NICU families when we're bringing our med medically fragile babies home. So transitioning home. I just want to uh, let everyone know, we want you to stick around to the very end today because our friends at Huggies are going to be giving giving away two cases of their softest diapers. So you, we want you to have the happiest baby on the block and have the softest diapers. So stay around. We got two trivia questions at the very end. And so two winners are going to win two cases each of diapers. So who wouldn't want that? So thanks and stick around. And now I'm just going to throw it over to you, Dr. Karp, and let you get us started in talking about sleep and milestones and transitioning home. Super. And maybe I'll even swing a little bit more into, um, into, into talking about older kids as well. You know, the, the interesting thing is sometimes when you have a baby in the NICU, it's not the baby that's the hardest part. It's your three-year-old at home who's giving you the, the difficulties. So we'll see if we have some time to talk about that, that too. Um, and then open, open field for questions, you know, um, to, to see if, um, if I can answer questions or be helpful. Yeah. I'll remind you, so <clears throat> questions in the Q&A section. So sometimes we do that in chat, but let's do that in the Q&A section. And uh, Leanne will be monitoring that for us and we'll make sure that we get those questions as many as we can answer today. Thanks, Kelly. So um, I guess the most important first step is um, to talk, I wanna talk a little bit about um, this book that I wrote. It's a video, actually I don't even recommend my book. I know it sounds funny, but there's a book called The Happiest Baby on the Block and there's a video by the same name and I kind of feel like you learn better by watching how to take care of a young baby than reading a 200 page book, which is you know, hard to get through and hard to remember. Um, these um, the techniques that I talk about, it's kind of a new idea in pediatrics, which is that um, um, babies in an odd sort of way, even a full term baby is born before they're ready for the world. 
uh, we all know about the three trimesters of pregnancy. And there's a concept called the fourth trimester, which is that babies are really born three months, even a full-term baby, three or four months before they're ready for the world. And what that means is it takes until they're four months to really be smiling and cooing and interacting and really be members of the family. And for those first four months, you're holding them and rocking them and shushing them and feeding them all the time and, and pretty much imitating what your, what your uterus was doing for free back those nine months before. Of course, when you're born prematurely, then it's even more months that you didn't quite get that full amount that the baby needs. And it extends this period of time when, when a parent has to um, give all of that nurturing, holding, and rhythmic stimulation. Um, it's the, uh, the interesting thing, if you understand that you're imitating the womb, then the next question is, well, what's it like inside the womb? And it turns out this is a surprise to a lot of people because it is not like quiet and still in there and just a peaceful little world. It is a symphony of sensations. The sound is louder than a vacuum cleaner, 24 seven inside the womb. I mean, they, they can hear your voice and they can hear sounds from the outside, but mostly what they hear is the blood flow, the rrm, rrm, rrm. People are used to the sound, that sound when you go to the obstetrician, when they put that little microphone on your belly and you hear but when the baby is inside and they're underwater and they're surrounded by everything, you know, you don't hear the high pitch sounds. So actually it's a rumbly low pitch sound that the, fam that the babies are hearing. And uh, they're constantly held, right? They're bundled into that little bundle there. Um, they can't stretch their arms out. Um, and and um, they're really not used to that freedom. They barely can move their hands an inch back and forth. And then the, there's constant motion. Every time the mother breathes, her diaphragm is rocking against the uterus. And every time she's walking, of course, the baby is bouncing around. So, um, so then you're born and especially like in a NICU, you're put into a bed, it's flat, it's still. They try to make it more quiet, you know, talk softly, put the blanket over the isolate so that there's less light and less distractions. And you, you, you think that what you're trying to do is make it as quiet and still as possible. You put the baby on the back most of the time, unless they're little, little preemies when we put them on the stomach. Um, but actually for the babies, being on the back is weird. They've never been on the back. It is absolutely the right position for them to sleep in, but it's the hardest position for you to calm a baby in. And that's why we love things like kangaroo care, where you put the baby against your skin and you're carrying your baby and, um, and just carrying and holding and rocking babies is so wonderful for them. That's what they respond to the most. Um, and all of that is the imitation of the womb. So what's good about watching this little video is you learn that something called the five S's, which are five steps that help you imitate the womb to be like the best womb imitator that you know. Um, and the first step is swaddling babies. And that's with their arms down, really snug. And some NICUs recommend wrapping the babies with the arms up, which is fine for when the babies are awake and feeding and looking around. But when the baby is sleeping, they actually do better with their arms down because if their hands are up, they try to you know, find their thumbs and they whack themselves in the face and they usually wake up more and they have more trouble sleeping. Um, the second S is the side or stomach position which is great for calming the baby. Again, only the back is the right position for sleep, especially once you're transitioning home. The third S is shushing or white noise. And um, we recommend using a white noise machine or, or some kind of a, of a white noise product that can help keep the babies calmer. The third S is swinging or rhythmic motion. And this is a tricky one because when you carry the baby in a carrier, of course, the baby's getting all that rhythm of the day. But what about when you put them to sleep at night? Because when you do that, they're totally still. And you might like to sleep in a totally still bed in a quiet room, but for babies, it's weird. And so what happens is when they wake up and they all, all babies wake up two or three times a night. In fact, even adults wake up two or three times a night, except you wouldn't remember it if everything is normal in your house. You will remember it if someone's scratching at your window or you smell smoke then you'll wake up all the way or if the telephone rings. But for most of us, even though we wake up a little bit, we, we don't wake up all the way and remember it. Well, babies also three, four times a night, they're waking up. 
even when we say the baby is sleeping the whole night, they're really not. They're actually waking up three or four times and then they put themselves back to sleep. And so um, in the beginning, if they're in this quiet, still bed, when they wake up, it's too, too still. It's too boring. It's too blah. They go, come, you with long hair, come back here. Hold me, rock me, feed me. And so they want that company and they need those rhythms. And um, if they have some motion and sound, then that helps them fall back asleep more e easily. So the fourth S is swinging, and I'll talk about that in a minute. And then the fifth S is sucking, which is the icing on the cake. It's always, once you calm the baby down, then when you suckle them at the breast or you give them a pacifier or, or a bottle to suck on, that allows them to totally get relaxed and get ready for sleep. So, um, so, so how do you make this transition home? Um, you're going from the hospital where you've got all of that support and help, of course. It can be a little bit scary when you're going home and you, know, you, get, <laughs> you, you walk out of the hospital with your baby and you're going, do they know what they're doing letting me take this baby home? And then you get home and it feels like, oh my gosh, it's all on our shoulders. Um, of course, fortunately, it's, you know, it's not rocket science taking care of a baby. Um, there are a couple of skills that really get you through the process. Um, and I usually would tell my patients that there are th really three jobs you have when you take the baby home. The first job, of course, is feeding the baby successfully, whether that's breastfeeding or bottle feeding, whatever you're doing, you know, making sure that that's going well. And usually by the time you're going home, of course, that's, that's well established once you're getting out of the NICU um, or the nursery. Um, the second is calming crying. And the third is getting sleep. Now, it's kind of interesting about those three because there's lots of help for, for moms and dads about feeding their babies. There are lactation consultants and La Leche League and books and magazines, but almost no help about calming crying and getting sleep. In fact, most people are taught, you know, but babies, they wake up a lot. You can't really expect your baby to sleep more than two or three hours. And and it may take months and months before they're better sleepers. And some babies cry a lot. We call it colic. And we don't know really what causes that. But it can be, it can be tough to get through. But, but um, you just, there's nothing you can do. You got to wait three or four or five months for them to get over it. Um, and all that makes sense. And that's what every doctor tells you and the nurses tell you. But the interesting thing about this is that it's not right. It's actually... Not right. We can help babies sleep better right from the very first days that we take them home and we can help them cry less. And the way that I know that we can do that is because you take a baby and you drive them in the car. If you were to drive a baby all night in the car, they're going to sleep an extra hour or two and they're going to cry much less. And so it turns out that the thing that babies need are these rhythms. And driving around the car, you're giving them a rhythmic sound, a rhythmic motion. And some babies, you have to drive them in the car on a back road. Or, you know, they need that kind of extra bounce. Um, some babies just need a little bit more vigor. You see the nurses rocking them slowly shh, back and forth. But sometimes you have to really kind of dance to the Rolling Stones to get the babies to, to settle down. Um, and um, the cool thing about learning the five S's is that once you practice this, you watch the video two or three times, um, you can um, uh, get pretty skilled. It's not, it's not rocket science. <clears throat> and once you do it with your baby four, five, six, seven, eight times, you start to learn, this is what my baby likes. Swaddling is the cornerstone. They all have to be swaddled with the arms down. That's, even though they fight that and the baby looks like they hate it, they don't get a vote. You know what I mean? With rights come responsibilities and they're not responsible yet enough to, to stay calm. So they really need their hands restricted. And I know that that gets confusing for parents because it seems like they want their hands free, but it's not up to them yet. We have to be parents and we have to kind of take control of the situation a little bit. Then you layer on the this, this sucking and the swaddling and the white noise and uh, rather the, the motion and the side stomach position, and you see what works. And when you see what works with your baby and you do it again and again, you'll learn, this is my go-to. This is what's gonna work to help settle my baby. And even colicky babies, usually we can calm colicky babies in a minute or two, when you, when you learn the right way to do these techniques. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, the, um, 
but it takes practice. And that's why we made this video because you can be taught it by the nurses at the hospital, but then you get home and your baby's screaming at 11 o'clock at night. It's easy to get nervous and get stressed and forget everything that you just learned. And I find that people watch the video, then they watch it again and again, and they practice it while they're watching it. And that's really how they, they learn the techniques. Now, um, what happens when you're asleep though? How do you calm the baby when you're asleep? Well, it's gonna wake you up, of course. And most of the time when the baby wakes up, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> the baby is hungry. And so just feeding your baby is what's gonna take care of that issue. Um, I personally recommend, parents get kind of confusing input about how to breastfeed. You know, should you feed on one side or both sides? How long on one breast before to go to the other breast? And what I usually recommend to parents is just to feed nurse on one side for five or six minutes, then take the baby off and burp the baby. And if the baby's still hungry, put them on the other side. Because the way the breasts work is they collect milk over two or three hours and they fill up. And after the baby suckled on one side, they've emptied that collecting system, but the other side is full and ready to go. So when you switch the baby, the baby gets a little bit more milk that way, and they're going to sleep a little bit longer because of that. Um, then um, then when in the middle of the night, if they're not hungry and they're waking up, what, do you, what are you supposed to do? Well, one of the things we did, and we're really excited about this, is we've created a new type of baby bed called SNOO. Um, S-N-O-O. -O. Now, most baby beds just kind of sit there, right? You just put the baby in, it's a crib or a bassinet or, or a Moses basket, and the baby's just lying there. <clears throat> and um, they're on their backs. Some babies hate being on the back because their legs have never been stretched out before. They, they want to be kind of a little bit more curled up. And parents will say, my baby only sleeps on top of me. Of course, that's not safe. Um, or sleeping on the stomach is not safe for newborn babies. So we have to figure out ways to get them happy on the back. And, and, and that's by giving them a little bit of these five S's. So we've created this baby bed that really imitates the womb. It's kind of like a continuation of those womb experiences all night long in all naps. So it rocks the baby back and forth. It makes a shh kind of a rain on the roof, white noise sound. And, uh, and it cuddles the baby or uh, swaddles the baby very securely. It's a super easy swaddle. We call it the five second swaddle because it literally takes five seconds. And then you attach that to the bed. There are little safety clips that allow you to attach the swaddle to the bed so the baby can't roll over. So then when you go to bed at night, you don't have to worry. The baby's not gonna roll to an unsafe position. Baby's gonna, baby can move, but they cannot flip. And uh, then you turn the bed on, it rocks them back and forth, it shushes them. And if the baby cries, the bed senses that and it starts going a little faster, a little louder. If the baby continues crying a little faster, a little louder, and it goes up four different levels, which really imitates the nurses or it imitates you, it imitates a caregiver. And this is one of the curious things about parents today because parents, and even NICU parents, they go home and they think that, well, you know, it's my job. I'm the mom, you're the dad, or you're the, my partner. It, it's our job to take care of this baby. That's what a normal family is. It's, you know, two parents and a child, or sometimes one parent and a child. That is the most abnormal family that ever existed. And what I mean by that is it's like that saying, it takes a village to raise a child. Today, if you have a nanny or a night nurse, you're, you know, you're pretty well off. Um, not many people can afford that. But up until 100 years ago, and for the entire history of humanity, everybody had five nannies. You had your grandma, your aunt, your older sister. You had um, you, the next door neighbor's older daughter. You had lots of people to help you. And today it's really all on the shoulders of parents. And during COVID, you can't even get a babysitter or you can't even have family members come over sometimes because, um, you're trying to stay safe and keep the baby and keep your cells from getting sick, which you, you, know, which you need to take super seriously. Um, and so we created this bed to be a caregiver. And this is really like a 24 hour nanny for you. It rocks and shushes the baby. Every time you need to take a shower or fix a meal or, or get some sleep or play with your three-year-old, you now have an assistant that can hold and rock and meet the baby's needs. 
And if the baby cries, like I said, it goes a little faster and more jiggly. And either the bed calms the baby, or if the baby's still fussing after a minute or two, you just take the baby out and feed the baby or change the diaper, whatever the baby needs. This becomes an enormous support for parents um, to be able to get the rest you need. Um, the bed is really kind of, like I said before, it's like driving them in the car all night long. So um, you get that extra hour or two of the baby's sleep. And we've now studied over 10,000 babies. So it's the largest study on baby sleep ever done. And we've demonstrated we add one to two hours to a baby's sleep right from the very beginning weeks of life. So even for a preemie, you, they can transition directly into the SNU. And in fact, now we're actually in 75 major hospitals all across the United States where they're using the beds in the hospitals for premature babies, for babies withdrawing from drugs, for normal full-term babies, so that the mom after a C-section can get some sleep while the bed in her room is rocking and shushing the baby and meeting the baby's needs. So, well, I had one um, of those babies, he had to move all the time. And so I, I think that uh, this new would have been such a gift to us. Of course, he's 20 now, so we weren't, think we weren't that far ahead. But while we have time, I want to make sure that we answer some questions. And I do have a question here. Um, Megan is asking about that regular eat, play, sleep routine. Um, she had a 28-weeker. Uh, he's two months adjusted right now. And she's saying, you know, trying to get in, she's saying, how do we get to full feeds within 30 minutes um, when the baby is kind of snacking a lot? So she's saying, how do we get into a regular eat, play, sleep routine with a baby that snacks or constantly falls asleep while eating? So we know with our Nikki oh, grad. How old is the child now? How old is Megan? She says he's two months adjusted. Two months adjusted. Okay, great. Um, well, here's an interesting thing. I mean, human beings live in Alaska and we live in the Amazon jungle. We're very adaptable. So there's not one way that works for all babies. Uh, eat, play, sleep is, a, is something that a lot of parents are taught, but um, babies aren't taught it. I mean, in fact, most of us, after we have a big meal, we get sleepy. Babies automatically fall asleep when they're eating, um, even in the middle of a, of a feeding. So um, we often recommend letting the baby sleep after they, uh, you know, right after a feeding. Now, sometimes they fall asleep in the middle of the feeding and you gotta get them eating, otherwise they're waking up 20, 30, 40 minutes later hungry again. And so you can wake that baby up by undressing the baby or taking a wet washcloth and stroking the baby's face and neck to kind of cool the baby a little bit, tickle the toes a little bit so you can get that baby waking up to finish the feeding. A lot of times the reason the baby fell asleep during the feeding is because you were staying on one side. So when the baby nurses, the milk comes, it's called letdown, right? The milk comes pretty quickly. Maybe it's even dripping out of the other side. But after about seven or eight or 10 minutes, that milk is slowed down to a little slow drop at a time. And the baby falls asleep because it's too boring. So if you take the baby off burp them a little bit and switch to the other side, they'll be gulping that milk and that keeps the baby awake too. So, um, so what I would try is switching the breasts um, after seven or eight minutes, then seeing if the baby, if you can't keep the baby awake, that's fine to try that. And if the baby falls asleep, that's fine as well. And let them sleep at least with white noise and swaddle. We usually recommend swaddling for the first two months. Uh, we don't want babies who are rolling over to be swaddled unless they're in snoo because we secure them in snoo. Yeah. And actually now we rent snoo. Anyone can get this. We rent it for a little bit more than $4 a day. It's, I mean, essentially it's a Starbucks coffee um, <laughs> to have that extra helper at home. Right. And we and should you might not need the Starbucks coffee to stay awake if your baby's sleeping. <laughs> exactly. Well, let, let's move on to the next question because we have a couple popping up. So uh, this one, oh, I, I really feel for you because I, I have dealt with this too. Uh, separation anxiety. Uh, my NICU grad was born at 36 weeks and is now 16 months old and has begun to always have to be with me or touch me. So talk a little bit about that. The baby's 16 months old and I, you know, I would assume that that's pretty normal, uh, that yeah. there's some anxiety around separation, mm -hmm. but what can we do to help them uh, through, the, in, through that transition? 
Yeah, that's super normal. It's not at all uh, a sign of a problem, but but it becomes burdensome. And and you can you can teach over the next couple couple of weeks and couple of months your baby to be more independent. And so there are several ways that you do that. One way is to get a teddy bear or security blankets, whatever you see your baby likes. You might have to test four or five of those things to figure out which one your child likes. And when you find that one, get two of them <laughs> because you want to rotate them to make sure they smell the same and they have the same feel. And in case, God forbid, you ever lose one, you, you don't want to lose, uh, you don't want to be without it. Um, and you can have that at your bedtime routine. You can have that when you're just holding your child. Have it around when you're around, so your baby starts making the association that you're a you're a threesome, and that you you know he associates it with the comfort that he gets from you or she gets from you, and and then what you do so there's a book we talked about the happiest baby on the block. There's a book called the happiest toddler on the block, which is about kids eight months to about forty seven years of age because we all get to be toddlers when we get upset enough. So um, it teaches communication ways to help young children deal with their big emotions. And one of those techniques is called patient stretching. So this is a trick where you, you teach your child to become patient. Most people teach patients by saying, honey, just wait one second, I'll be right back, and then you leave. That's the worst way to teach patients. The best way to teach patients is to almost give your child what they want, and then you um, turn away for a few seconds and come back. So for example, your child is saying, mommy, mommy, pick me up, pick me up. And so you go just to pick them up and just so you're about to pick them up, you go, oh, wait, one second, one second, one second. And you turn around and pretend to do something literally just for two seconds. And then you turn right back around saying, good waiting, honey, and pick him up or pick her up. And do that eight or 10 times and then stretch it to five seconds and 10 and 15 seconds. And even with a 16 month old, you can teach a child to be a little bit more patient. Here, honey, hold your teddy bear. Mommy's gonna be right back. And you turn away for five seconds. And what you're gonna do is gradually teach your child to be a little bit more independent and be able to rely on his relationship with the teddy bear. Oh, I love that so much. And I think for those in the NICU that practice the scent cloth technique where we exchanged a piece of cloth that had our yes. smell with our baby um, to help in milk production and help them feel uh, safe when we weren't there and that bonding uh, in the NICU. So that's very similar, I think. And I, you know, it doesn't have to be an expensive teddy bear. Um, one of my favorite uh, uh, friends, she just used cloth diapers. And I thought that was brilliant because then they were mm -hmm. everywhere and the child, you, you could find them. You weren't searching at night for that favorite blanket or toy, but any cloth blanket. And like you said, she rotated them. So there were many of those cloth diapers around. Okay. We have another question for you. I have a 27 weeker, two weeks adjusted. So like a newborn uh, at home and they're gavage feeding. She sleeps great during the day, but will not sleep at night unless being held. What can we do? So is this where, even with a baby that's gavage feeding, can we do these, practice these five S's that you were talking about? Sure, sure, of course. No, you have to, for any baby. Um, all babies, right? It's what every grandma does, right? You rock and shush babies and hold them and cuddle them. It's just every culture does this. So this is, so watching this video would be a good idea. So you just learned those techniques. The other thing is, you know, sometimes people are told never wake a sleeping baby, but actually you have to wake them up. Uh, if they're sleeping too much during the day, they ain't going to sleep at night, right? They're only going to have certain, you know, whatever, it's 13, 14, 15 hours of sleep in a day at this age, maybe 16 hours, something like that. But, um, but if they get it all during the day, they're not going to sleep at night. So you want to wake your baby up um, at least every two hours. For a baby this age, I wouldn't let them go longer than two hours during the daytime, hour and a half to two hours. Then see if you can do another feeding. And the more calories you get in during the day, the less they're going to need at night. So you're going to, you know, massage their um, or sculpt their schedule into more of a daytime schedule. And then for sleep periods, you build in sleep cues. One of the easiest ones, of course, is swaddling. And the other one is white noise. And you can just get white noise off the internet, right? I mean, it's free. You can just download like rain on the roof sound and play that all night long. Because again, it's too quiet at night. And, and what you may be lucky enough to see is with the swaddling and white noise, your baby is relieved enough that they don't need to be on you as well. 
Thank you. And Christina, we'll be thinking about you. I know I'm happy for you to have your baby home. Congratulations. I know that was such a celebration, especially with COVID and everything for y'all to be home together. So okay. congratulations yeah. and good luck. And we hope that uh, y'all get on a better sleep pattern really soon. Well, I don't have any other questions coming in for you and we are at our time, 1.30. So what I'm gonna do real quick, uh, I want to remind everyone in the Q&A section, um, let's see, Leanne, can you show our slides? We have a couple of trivia questions. We'll see who gets close. You can Google it if you want to. The fastest Googler can win because most of us may not know the answers to these questions. But our friends over at Huggies, again, are giving us two cases to give to two winners uh, for trivia. And hey, if you get both questions right, then you can win uh, four cases of diapers. So are we ready? Let me, let me remind you though, before I forget, um, Huggy supports Hand to Hold in sponsoring our virtual support groups. So if you're in the NICU or even if you are home from the NICU, we have virtual support groups multiple times a week. We offer them in English and Spanish and uh, we want to support you. And so please think about joining these groups. Uh, you'll get lots more best practices from other NICU parents as well. And so we want you to be a part of that and that is sponsored by Huggies. All right, Leanne, if we, let's go with that first trip be a quick um, question. So again, two cases. So question number one, where are Huggies Nano Preemie diapers manufactured? Does anyone know where Huggies makes their Nano Preemie diapers? So I'm watching the Q&A. Feel free to Google it and we'll wait for that first answer to win two cases of Huggies softest diapers. Hopefully many of you got to use these Nano Preemie diapers. Hand to Hold was very involved in the development of these diapers. I was very happy to be uh, there as a parent in the manufacturing plant and touring every day uh, and part of the manufacture of those new really tiny diapers. Because back, Dr. Karp, if you'll remember, as a, a preemie 20 years ago, uh, there were no tiny diapers like this. Right. So our first guest was from Carol. Uh, I think that says uh, US, in a, no, very close, no, but that is not where they were manufactured first. So uh, nano preemie diapers, where is Huggies based? Cincinnati, no, thank you, Maya, no, not in Cincinnati. Let's see if one more guest, see if we can get it. I'm gonna give y'all a, a hint. Uh, think of cheese. I, I had never had cheese curds until I visited this state. So they are famous for their cheese curds and uh, maybe some cheese hats if you follow them. Yes, Maya, very smart, Wisconsin. So Maya, I'm gonna need to get with you uh, to get your contact information if you would mind sharing that with us. Um, Leanne, should you put those into the chat here in the Q&A? or just email me directly? Um, Maya, we'll get with you. We, we've got an email address for Maya? Okay, we'll get back to you, Maya, and get all of your contact information. Congratulations, two cases of diapers. So one more trivia question related to Huggies. Uh, we wanna know, let's see, Leanne, can you go to the next slide for me? There you go. Okay, so that's the Huggies diapers. They're showing here in Wisconsin. So how long have Huggies wipes been planted based. Can anyone tell me approximately when did Huggies start making plant-based wipes? And I'm not just, I love Huggies, but I didn't, we didn't of course have this sponsorship 20 years ago and their wipes were my outright favorite. They always work, never had any problems with those. And I carried them in my car until the kids were well into their preteen years for anything that we might need to have. So we're looking for an answer for how long have Huggies wipes been plant-based? Any guesses? They're Googling, you know they're Googling. So I'll just give you an important fact here uh, that I learned in touring the Huggies uh, manufacturing plant. Um, when 
when my daughter would wet her diaper, I would not always use a wipe to clean her. Uh, I always thought of wipes more as uh, if they had had a bowel movement, a number two. So I uh, thought of that as for cleaning them. But it is very, very important uh, that you are wiping and cleaning um, both boys and girls uh, if they have wet their diaper, not just uh, gone number two. So very important to always have those wipes available and why it's so important that they uh, be appropriate for sensitive skin and they have the right chemical makeup. So anyone have a guess for us on Huggies wipes and being plant-based. No answers, you just take a guess. Just throw out a number, any number. You still got it on there? Let's see. We have 2013, 42 years. No, we're not, we're a little far away. Let's see. Um, let's, let's just take it into the 90s. Um, a little more early 90s. We don't know. I'm going to tell Huggies they need to do a better job promoting how long they have been manufacturing these amazing wipes. Let's see. We're close. We're so close. Sandra Lee, you're very close. Sandra was almost there. Stephanie, Stephanie finally got it. Thank you, girls. I appreciate y'all's patience as we did that. I knew those questions would be a little hard, but those were for, directly from Huggies. So since 1990, Huggies has been uh, manufacturing plant-based wipes. They're very sensitive, uh, great wipes. Huggies are great people. Uh, again, they support our uh, support groups, our virtual support groups. So if you need support, if you are in the NICU or you're home from the NICU, please join Hand to Hold support groups. We have podcasts, multiple podcast channels, NICU Now, NICU and Beyond. Um, we have a podcast just for dads called NICU Dad Discussions. You can find all our podcasts on our website and we invite you to be a part of that. We have private Facebook group communities as well as our uh, Facebook group, which you probably learned about our webinar on today. But please go to handahold.org to find out about all of the ways that we are here to support your families. And we thank Huggies for being a very uh, faithful sponsor and supporter of Hand to Hold, which allows us to provide free support to you. So if you are in need of a peer mentor, even if you're home from the NICU, we can match you with a peer mentor to provide support by phone and email and text. Someone who's shared a similar birth experience, but might be several years out uh, from NICU graduation, so they're able to talk to you about what's to come. Well, Dr. Carp, I want to thank you again for being here, for all your great information that you provided, and as we continue to celebrate milestones, I'll also invite our families, if you were not in a hospital that provided a bead program and you did not leave the hospital with a commemorative of your baby's NICU journey. At Hand to Hold, we celebrate milestones. So that's the first hold, the first kangaroo care, the first diaper change. And we now offer that through our online store. So at handtohold.org, you can go to our online store and customize uh, your own personal milestone bead necklace uh, to commemorate your baby's journey through the NICU. So thank you, everyone. We appreciate you being here. Uh, Leanne and I will follow up with those winners to get you your cases of diapers. Dr. Karp, thank you for sharing thank your you. 25 thank years you. of experience as a pediatrician and uh, the best sleep expert in the world. I hope everyone will watch your video and read your book so we all have the happiest baby on the block. Thank you so much. I appreciate you very much. Thank you, everyone, for joining us for Handhold's first webinar. How do we do? Give us some feedback. Tell us what you want to learn and what we can bring to you. What speakers do you want to hear from and what can we talk to you about? Thank you so much for joining us. Y'all have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye, everybody. Be safe. Thank you.